So I'm Fred Upton, and uh, today we are continuing our tremendous bipartisan efforts on the 21st Century Cures Initiative with this Southwest Michigan Roundtable. Uh, launched formally this last spring, the initiative aims to save patients' lives through faster cures and helps employers in states like this great state of Michigan to continue to be a global leader in medical innovation. Today we're gonna to discuss ideas that we've received over the past number of months, and we look forward to more specific steps that we can take to accelerate the cycle of cures and the role Southwest Michigan's patients, researchers, medical professionals, advocates, and industry play in keeping America the innovation capital of the world. Over the past couple months, the 21st Century Cures Initiative has fostered a robust conversation, and a number of our committee members have held roundtables across the country to hear about how American innovation is providing hope, saving lives, and yes, creating jobs. Today is no exception. It's gonna provide an opportunity for us to see how Southwest Michigan can help accelerate the cycle of cures and make a real difference in the lives of every American. Whether it's cutting edge Parkinson's research happening at the Van Andel Institute, the potential game-changing diabetes treatments under development at Metabolic Solutions, or the breakthroughs that can continue to happen at Pfizer and Stryker, our region of Michigan has proven that it is at the forefront of advances in the life sciences field. I'm excited to welcome my colleague, Vice Chair of the Health Subcommittee from Texas, Dr. Burgess, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, Dr. Shuren uh, from uh, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, and to Southwest Michigan to hear firsthand all the good things that are being done here. And to continue our work towards more cures and treatments, we brought together really yet another all-star round table. Join us today, as I said, Dr. Burgess, Dr. Collins, Dr. Shuren, uh, Ms. Kirsten Axelson, the Vice President of Worldwide P Policy at Pfizer, Mr. Stephen Bonet, CEO of Metabolic Solutions, Mr. Richard Steck, VP of Global Regulatory Affairs of Perigo Pharmaceuticals, Dr. Hal Jensen, Founding Dean and Professor at Western Michigan University Homer Stryker Medical School of Medicine, Dr. Peter Jones, Research Director and Chief Scientific Officer of the Van Andel Institute, Mr. Kevin Lobo, Chairman and CEO of Stryker, uh, Mr. Tony Mandarino, Director of the Alex Mandarino Foundation, and Dr. Joe Miro, President, CEO, and Chief Medical Officer at the West Michigan Cancer Center. What we wanna do now is to, to hear from each of you, not a long introduction for sure, or what you're doing, I know we could take up a couple hours doing that, uh, but just a brief description of why, of why you're here, what you think is important, and then we, Mike and I, uh, wanna listen, and we'll have, in essence, a conversation conversation uh, really uh, finishing at, at 12 uh, as uh, Dr. Collins has got other activities across the country uh, as, as he uh, uh, departs uh, from Southwest Michigan. Uh, Dr. Collins, Francis, uh, why don't you start? And make sure that, uh, now this is, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to broadcast this later, uh, but let's make sure that the mics are close so that it provide the content that we want. Well, thank you, Congressman Upton, uh, for organizing this roundtable. I think this is the fourth of these that I've had the chance to take part in, uh, two of them in Washington, one in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and now here in Kalamazoo. As somebody who uh, was a Michigander uh, for nine years and very much loved being in this state, it's great to be back uh, in Michigan and to be able to talk about something that I think we can all agree to, that. We have great opportunities right now in medical research, but we have great needs. Uh, who in this room has not had their life touched either personally or through your family or your friends uh, with illness, illnesses that we currently don't have perfect answers to, uh, those 7,000 diseases that we know about that affect us. Currently, only 500 of those have treatments uh, that we are confident are actually providing benefit. So we have a ways to go. The good news is, We've never been at a more exciting time scientifically than we are right now. 
As the director of the National Institutes of Health, one of my opportunities to look across the landscape and see what's happening in biomedical research. And if you read my blog every Tuesday and Thursday, and I'm sure you do, uh, you will see these snapshots of things that are happening at a prodigious pace uh, that are truly exhilarating. But again, we need to build upon um, many of those basic science discoveries uh, to move this ball forward and come up with the devices, the diagnostics, the therapeutics that people are waiting for. And there's no time to waste. So having a round table of this sort to talk about how we accelerate the 21st century cures uh, could not be more appropriate. And again, uh, many thanks uh, to Fred and to his colleague Diana DeGette uh, in Colorado who have organized uh, this bipartisan effort recognizing that medical illness uh, should not be a political issue. It's an issue for all of us. From my perspective, there are quite a number of things that we could do that would accelerate the process of getting from a good idea uh, to a clinical benefit. And the opportunity to hear from all of you uh, here in Michigan is, I'm sure, going to be of great interest. I would say that the, from the perspective of the NIH, while we are in Bethesda, Maryland, and as a result of Congressional decisions and support by the taxpayers allocate about $30 billion a year to medical research. It goes on all over the country in the finest institutions, including those here in Michigan. $576 million of grant monies went to the state of Michigan in the most recent year for which we have full numbers. And that has resulted in a lot of really exciting science and breakthroughs that you read about, but they're coming from this support. We are under a stressful situation. Now, there's no question about that. Over the last 10 years, NIH has lost about 23% of its purchasing power for medical research by essentially flat budgets that have been eroded by the effects of inflation. And that means for investigators, uh, this is not an easy time uh, to follow your dream and to pursue that innovative idea, your chance when you send a grant to NIH, which traditionally has been about one in three, is down now to about one in six making this a very difficult time for many laboratories uh, to keep themselves going at the level that we would like to see happen. And we are leaving, as a result of that, some really good science on the table because we can't support it. So all the more reason why we have to be really efficient in the way in which we use those resources, working with other partners in the private sector or with foundations. And I think, as is a major focus of this roundtable, identifying things that are getting in the way of our ability to be efficient with the resources that we have. From NIH's perspective, there's quite a number of those things that will help us, and I've shared a number of them already uh, uh, with Fred and with uh, Dr. Burgess and with others on this committee, uh, such things as trying to figure out ways to make it easier for patients to participate uh, without concerns that their privacy is going to somehow be uh, involved or violated in the process of being part of a clinical trial. Such things as making it easier for scientists uh, to spend their time doing science uh, instead of paperwork, because there's a lot of paperwork right now, and some of it actually isn't all that useful. Uh, and some administrative issues uh, that would make it easier uh, for us as the holder of this remarkable trust from the public to get the job done uh, without spending so much time uh, doing things that are perhaps not so productive. And there's quite a long list of those, and maybe in the course of this morning we could touch on some specifics. But I just think it's wonderful that we have this opportunity, that the Congressman is taking the time to listen uh, over these now some 20 or 24 gatherings uh, to many different stakeholders, and I'm sure this morning is going to give us some additional new ideas, and we're all here to listen and to learn. So thank you for the invitation to come to Michigan. Jeff? Sure. Well, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Burgess, um, I want to thank you as well. Um, you had kind of asked why we're here, so beyond the fact that we were invited. Um, for us, patients are at the heart of what we do. I mean, we are about how we improve the health and the quality of life of patients, and the 21st Century Cures Initiative um, is founded in that, and we, we share that goal. Um, what I also want to congratulate and thank you for is how you've gone about it. These roundtables are unique uh, in the DC world. Uh, DC is usually an adversarial uh, <laughs> environment. It's sort of the, uh, <laughs> the old gladiators from Roman times. But here is really a chance to have dialogue. So it truly is business is different in Washington and outside. So thank you. 
Um, I want to build off of something that uh, Francis had said last night, and I should say, um, you're also an equal opportunity chairman, so this is my fourth round table as well, and I appreciate NIH and FDA getting those same chances. Um, you had said something, a lot of people shook their heads yes, that even in dire times, when things are tough and you're dealing with an emerging threat, it's so important that you get the data on medical products to know that they work. Right? And that's for both drugs, it's vaccines, and it's medical devices, whether they be therapeutics or diagnostics. But what we have to solve is, how do we get that data more quickly and at lower cost? And the other thing we have to do is we have to move away from this mindset that medicine has a lot of knowns, that we have these binary decisions of we do investigation and then we know stuff and we can improve things and they're out there. Well, the truth is, and for the medical students out there, as a former teacher at a medical school, I can tell you medicine is investigational. We're always learning, we're always studying, there's always things we don't know. And if we change that mindset, we realize the question is, when do we know enough to expose more patients to technology? And we can do that as long as we keep learning. So here's some things we need to look at. One of the great inefficiencies in healthcare today is that we generate knowledge all the time, and we don't make good use of it. So as future doctors out there, you're gonna sit with your patients, you're gonna gather information, and we don't take advantage of it. We could learn so much if we did from those patient encounters. So what we need to do is take advantage of electronic health records. If we do that, we can actually lower the time and cost in clinical trials. We can leverage those encounters and the data capture in electronic health records rather than what we do today in clinical studies. And we build into that into clinical trial networks. We can also reduce time and cost. Now, we can go further. If we're gathering that information, then we know we will have a good understanding of what happens with technologies. Here's a challenge. If I throw a device out there in the world, now I want to study it. People are not incentivized to enroll in a clinical study. It's already approved. But if as part of their routine encounters I get that information, I may not need a clinical study. So the FDA is already putting the pieces in place to have a much more flexible approach for technologies to come to market, where if they're really important, we can accept more uncertainty about them because we'll get some of that data that we'd otherwise get pre-market, post-market. Now imagine a world where we knew we would get that data. We really could shift that model, be far more flexible, still making sure we've got safe and effective devices going to market, but accepting some more uncertainty so we get it to patients faster, but we'll learn, and we think Congress can really help us there in freeing up that data and having a system in place for us to capture it. Thanks, Jeff. Just pass that to Kevin. So good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Lobo. I'm the CEO of Stryker. Uh, we're based here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We're about a $9 billion medical device company, uh, very fast growing. And innovation is the lifeblood of, of our company. So we invest uh, over 6% of our sales in R&D, and we've grown that R&D spend uh, double digits over the last three years. So it's a real focus for us. I'm very excited to hear these words. This initiative is fabulous. And, and frankly, together with AdvaMed, which is the Trade Medical Device Trade Association, we're working together uh, on a breakthrough pathway program, which would hopefully expand the definition of the breakthrough technology and really accelerate the adoption. I know FDA already has a, a number of initiatives underway and we're partnering with FDA. And then obviously then get that connected to CMS so that these breakthroughs actually get approved and get covered so that patients can be treated. So that's one of the initiatives that were underway. But uh, we're really excited to be part of this and uh, look forward to uh, the rest of the discussion.